Welcome to the Untold Tales Audio Anthologies. Written by Dr. Jeffrey A. Robinson and narrated by Melissa Del Toro Schaffner. Life is but a dream. I had a dream that wasn't a dream at all. At least, I hope it was a dream. It all started after I had been hiking all afternoon near the north rim of the Grand Canyon. I had finally returned to the campground where I'd parked my RV and had taken a seat on the ground overlooking the canyon. I had decided to wait for the sunset, since I had heard they were quite spectacular. It was only five in the afternoon, and there was still about an hour before the sun would reach the distant cliffs. Then the strangest thing happened. I must have fallen asleep because I found myself floating in a dark, empty void. There was no light, no sound. I couldn't feel anything, not even my arms or fingers. It was unusual because I wasn't afraid at all. I felt quite comfortable and found the complete sensory deprivation to be relaxing. But then I smelled something. It was faint at first, delicate, almost the memory of an odor. It was the smell of my mother's cooking, from my childhood. The type of smell that woke you from a sound sleep in the morning, as breakfast cooked downstairs. I could clearly discern the warm aroma of pancakes and the sweet fragrance of maple syrup, as well as the mouth-watering tang of freshly cooked bacon. As I involuntarily took a deep breath to cherish the moment, it faded and was replaced with another. This time, the smell was of freshly cut grass, powerful and nearly overwhelming. I almost gasped at its intensity. I could visualize the wide expanse of lawn behind our house on a warm summer's day, and then detected in the background the scent of oil and fuel from the nearby gasoline lawnmower. Sniffing, I also smelled the sweat on my T-shirt from the physical exertion of a task well done. Then, memories of other smells assaulted me. First, there were flowers, roses from a wedding I had attended once, lilacs from a spring garden festival, lavender from my grandmother's soap, and, of course, jasmine. Then. My dream became troubled, as these strong sensations began to come more rapidly. Dust from the dirt road that I took when I walked to school, the scent of leather from a shop I once visited in Italy, a wave of cool, moist, salty ocean air swept over me and was replaced with the warm, dry breath of a desert breeze. I tried to awaken, but the nature of my sensations changed. First, I just heard noise, like static, Then, after a while, I recognized the sound as rain. Within the random white noise, I could hear individual drops of water impact the window next to me, and in the background, I could make out the rhythmic dripping of water as it slowly struck the windowsill. Outside, the sound of running water was clear and distinct, as the rain collected in rivulets and flowed down to join other threads of water that hurried down to the creek and then to the river as it walked to the sea. Then the rain died down, and I heard the sound of a distant train, sounding its whistle very far away. It was like some giant distant animal wailing in the night while everyone slept. I remembered waking as a child and standing in my open window, listening intently to the unseen trains and wondering where they were headed to. But then those sounds of the early morning were replaced by the roar of ocean surf that made me tremble as huge waves of water crashed on nearby rocks at the base of an unseen cliff. Each sensation appeared from nowhere and lingered just long enough to conjure a memory from the depths of my mind. Sounds of traffic and airplanes, crowds and blaring music. Each evoked a different thought about the different time. I struggled to awaken and reached out around me. My right hand touched something that felt like sand. I grasped the warm grains and clutched them tightly, but they slipped through my fingers. At the same time, my other hand buried itself in the snow, the powdered ice burning into my skin like liquid fire. Finally, I opened my eyes and sat up. I was in a dark room. My hands were firmly planted on the ground beside me, holding me upright. I raised one hand in front of me and could barely make out the silhouette of my fingers against the featureless gray expanse beyond. 
The floor beneath me was hard and slightly cold, but not like metal, though colder than wood would have been. It felt more like ceramic or porcelain, but not as smooth. I rolled over, climbed onto my hands and knees, and crawled forward until I reached a wall. It was smooth and made of the same material as the floor, but there was no corner or join between the two. The floor simply curved and flowed up into the wall. Steadying myself, I stood and wondered where the hell I could be. The room seemed slightly brighter now, but I couldn't tell if the ambient light had increased or whether my eyes were simply adjusting to the dark. With one hand on the wall, I tentatively took a few steps forward. The wall was curved, and after a half a dozen steps, I decided it was circular in shape, and perhaps thirty or forty feet across. As far as I could tell so far, it was completely featureless, for all I could perceive was an endless, formless expanse of gray. It was then that I heard her crying. I took a few steps more before I saw her on the ground— she was an almost formless patch of darkness a few steps in front of me. I didn't know who she might be, but I approached and knelt beside her. The light was too dim for me to tell the color, but she appeared to be wearing a dark dress with mid-length sleeves that stopped at her elbows. She softly sobbed, and each exhalation of her breath was a tiny moan. I worried that she might be hurt and reached out to comfort her, but I pulled back my hand at the last instance. I didn't want to scare her. It's okay, I said softly. You're not alone. She sniffed and raised her head. Instinctively, I reached out my hand and touched her arm. It's okay, I repeated. I'm here. Her crying slowed. What's your name? I asked softly. Caroline, she replied as she pushed herself up from the floor. I could tell she was trying to make out my form in the darkness. I'm Josh, I offered. For several seconds, neither of us spoke. Then she asked, Where are we? I don't know, I said. I was sitting at the base of a tree, resting after a hike. I thought I'd fallen asleep. I could see her silhouetted form nod. Me too, she said. I was resting on the front porch swing, looking out across our front yard. I thought I'd fallen asleep too, but then the dreams came and I couldn't wake up. I know, I replied. It was the same for me. I was at the north rim of the Grand Canyon, I offered. I was at my family's home northeast of Savannah, Georgia, she said in return. After a short pause, she asked, Is there anyone else here? And where are we? I don't know, I said. Then I started to stand, but realized something was different. Something was wrong. I felt lighter somehow. I felt like I was floating a little bit. I climbed to my feet and stood. Flexing my feet, I rose up on my tiptoes and then jumped a little into the air. It was then that I discovered that I was lighter than normal, as if... Gravity were somehow weaker. A wave of adrenaline shot through my body as I realized that it could only mean one thing. I wasn't on Earth anymore. Suddenly, I felt like I was being watched. I didn't say anything, but Caroline must have sensed my alarm, for she too stood and grasped my hand. We're not alone, I whispered. Her fingers tightened on my own. Finally, I said loudly, you're out there, aren't you? You're listening to us and watching us. For a second, I thought I was making a fool of myself, but then a low, gentle voice sounded and said, Yes, we are here. I actually staggered at the sound of that voice, and Caroline had to steady me. Who are you? I demanded. Where have you taken us? You are both safe, said the voice. We mean you no harm. We only brought you here to talk to you. That is all. But who are you? I asked again. We are just strangers, visitors, travelers, who are just passing through. We don't mean to disturb you, either of you, but there is so much to learn and so little time. What do you mean, so little time? I mean that time is short, 
Events will occur that none of us can stop, and we therefore only have a limited amount of time to meet you and others like you. You mean something bad is going to happen to us? No, no, not at all. Not to you. I didn't mean to alarm you. What is destined to occur will not happen in your lifetime, but we still only have a little time to get to learn more about you and your kind. So you're aliens? I mean, extraterrestrials. We are just strangers from another place and another time. We can only stay for a short while, a mere moment of your time. But we need so desperately to learn more about you and your world before we lose that chance. Why are you here? I said. Just to ask you some questions, nothing more. I squinted, trying to make out the dark forms that were only a few strides away. Then I remembered the dreams. You were the ones who were giving us those dreams, weren't you? Yes. We did not mean to cause any distress. We were just curious. I reflected on those dreams for a moment. It was as if my mind had been stretched across a musical instrument, like a gigantic harp with a thousand strings. And each time they touched my mind, a memory was summoned, like a note stuck by the strumming of one of those delicate chords. Why did you touch our minds and call up those memories? You were playing us like musical instruments, plucking thoughts and sensations from our minds. Yes, but we meant no harm. Your thoughts and your memories, your perceptions of you are, are all tied to those things. Remembrances that are buried so deep within you that you have almost completely forgotten them. The thoughts and memories for your people are so closely linked to the sensations of smell and sound, of touch and feeling, that it is easier to access them by reaching them that way. I considered that for a moment. Then I thought that perhaps the human mind was like a giant stew pot cooking on the stove. The heavy bits fall to the bottom and the clear broth rises to the top. You have to periodically stir the pot or it won't cook properly. Then I realized that that was what they must have been doing. They had been stirring the pot, so to speak, and drudging up old memories within us. That's right, said the voice. After all, who you are is really based on all memories. We only wanted to learn more about you. The voice said in a plaintive, almost apologetic tone. You mean you can read my mind? No, not really. But sometimes I can read you, and I can guess at what you haven't yet said. It's body language and the way you pause, the way you tilt your head, the expression on your face, and the inflection in your voice. So what do you want from us? asked Caroline. She had been quietly holding my arm all this time, so I reached up and covered her hand with my own. This was the first time she had spoken to them. We just want to talk if we could, came the gentle reply. If you don't want to, we can return you to where you were at any time. We just have a few questions that we would like to ask. I looked down at Caroline, and she looked up at me and nodded. We both sat down, with her still clinging to my arm. Why did you bring two of us here? she asked. Because your kind is often scared when they are alone, we don't want you to be scared. Caroline looked up at me and smiled. Go ahead, she said. Ask your questions. Then the alien reached out and touched our minds, the way he had before. What does this remind you of? it asked. Then, in an instant, I smelled a wood-burning fire, like you might have at a campout. It conjured up a memory of cooking marshmallows, and I smelled graham crackers and melting chocolate. Caroline had a similar recollection, and she explained how her younger brother Bobby would work diligently to cook the perfect marshmallow in the dancing flames of the fire. But she never had that skill or patience. She laughed, explaining that her best efforts always resulted in her sugary prize bursting into flame, though the inside always provided the same gooey, liquidy delight. Eventually, she developed a taste for burnt marshmallows and prided herself that she could claim her treat long before Bobby had finished his masterpiece. Then, the aliens invoked another memory that led both Caroline and me to tell other stories. We talked about school, places we'd worked, and people we'd met. 
at one point. She told me that I reminded her of Bobby. I perked up and asked sarcastically if he was anywhere near as good-looking as I was. Her eyes softened as she explained that Bobby had died a year earlier in an automobile accident. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't know. She shrugged and said, It's okay. Life goes on. Hours seemed to pass. Eventually, the alien started asking different questions, things like, What makes you sad? What makes you happy? What are you afraid of? What is something you are proud of? What is something you are ashamed of? What would you change if you could go back and make things different? What do you wish you could change in yourself or others? Their questions are not probing as much as they were simply thought-provoking. Sometimes I didn't have an answer. At one point, my mouth grew dry, and I told them I was thirsty. After a long moment, a long, slim arm with thin, delicate fingers reached out of the shadows in front of me and pushed a medium-sized bowl toward me. I picked it up. It was a plain colored glass bowl filled with liquid. I tentatively sipped it and found it was clear water, cool and quite refreshing. I passed the bowl to Caroline, who drank her fill. Then she handed it back to me and I finished it off, placing the bowl in my lap. Our conversations continued and I tried to ask some questions back at the aliens, but they always evaded me, claiming that it wasn't important or that we wouldn't understand. Finally, the alien said, We are almost done. We only have one question left. What is the thing that is most important to you? I started to answer but stopped. I looked at Caroline and I couldn't think of what to say. I thought some more about what I could say. Then I considered what I probably should say. Finally, I admitted that I wasn't sure. It's as if what's important changes over time. What I thought was important when I was younger isn't nearly as important as today. From one moment to the next, our attention is drawn to different things. And that's what's most important to us. And what's important to us is usually the thing that's right in front of us. But that isn't right, is it? The alien replied, There is some truth in what you say. All of us are swept along the river of reality, and each of us swims in the current of destiny. Some things we can change, and others we cannot. I nodded. Yeah, but we can swim, can't we? We can hurry along with the current or swim off to one side. We can even swim upstream for a while. We can pick what we do and, to some degree, where we are going. We can choose what's important and we can even choose who we will become, isn't that so? There was a long silence and the alien said, Yes, that is precisely the point. Then I woke up. I opened my eyes, blinking against the bright light. I was back on the cliffs overlooking the Grand Canyon, but the sun still hadn't reached the horizon. I checked my watch and it was still only a few minutes after five. No time had passed. I wondered, had I fallen asleep? Did I dream it all? Did any of it really happen? I glanced down and saw next to me an object that I hadn't noticed there before. It was just an ordinary glass bowl that was colored a delicate light blue. So it must have happened, I thought. Or did it? As I held the bowl in my hands, I wondered if it had been there even before I had sat down, and I simply hadn't noticed it before, at least not consciously. Perhaps it had been here all along, and some other traveler who'd passed this way before had dropped it, and I simply dreamt about it. I studied it and found absolutely nothing unique or unusual about the bowl, other than the fact that I was certain that Caroline and I had shared a drink from it. I have to go find her, I thought, suddenly convinced that it was critically important. I have to know whether it was just a dream. She'll know if it was real or not. That is, if she's real. I stood up, holding the bowl, and slowly walked back to my RV in the nearby parking lot. I had suddenly lost interest in waiting for the sunset. Thank you for listening. We love our listeners, fans, and patrons here at Untold Tales, and we would love to hear from you. 
please consider leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, letting us know what your favorite story has been in our three seasons of storytelling so far. We'd love to continue shaping our podcast with stories that you'd like to hear. As always, thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.